Welcome back, guys, to another podcast. And I'm very fortunate to have Stephanie Chivers with me today. And we're going to be able to talk about something just a little bit different from dating, but still talk about dating as well. Now, Stephanie specializes in helping women with coming off of alcohol. Uh, that That is right saying that, isn't it? it that it's that you, you help women sort of move off of having alcohol and basically just live life without uh, having alcohol at all and completely alcohol free. Yeah, I mean, I do lots of things, but I suppose that the front facing, the public facing thing that people see a lot of me for is that I run a little community interest company and we support women to reduce, take a break and stop drinking. Um, I don't preach abstinence. You know, the reducing bit is really important. There's a lot of people out there talking about abstinence, which I feel is not appropriate for a lot of people and might be a little bit unachievable, a bit too much. So the reducing can bring some massive wins. Um, so it's quite important that we talk about that as well. But yeah, I do lots of other little some pieces random stuff sort of poaching behavior change all sorts of things I do work with some men sometimes as well well I, I must admit I mean I had a look at your website and stuff and I did I found it really fascinating and I, I really kind of appreciate the the message that you've got on there that you don't have to rely on alcohol um, for whatever reason whether it be for dating or just in general social life and uh, although yes my my majority of my audience are men I do think as well it's just so important that they understand that when they are going on lots of dates and especially if they have a lot of anxiety that they don't always need to be reliant on the alcohol to try and overcome that anxiety or to uh, kind of mask it with some kind of uh, confidence I don't know if uh, inhibitions is probably the right word for it but definitely just to give them that that liquid luck which I suppose yeah quoting Harry Potter there yeah just to kind of give them that that liquid luck so they can have that confidence to talk to uh, the women especially if it's a first date for them so I think just to start off I mean I'd love to kind of know more about your background like like how did you how did the business start um uh what was the kind of inspiration for it and uh, and what what sort of work do you do with uh, a lot of your clients Gosh, it's evolved. So um, I'll try and keep it short because it's a long story and we could go back a long way. But yeah, essentially, no, sure. um, I suppose like most people my age, I'm 55, you know, so I'm that sort of free party generation. Um, so we did a lot of partying. And we had a lot of fun and it wasn't always good. So that, you know, real mixed sort of background around drugs and alcohol. And then later on, the alcohol came in. And I got myself into quite a bit of trouble with it, which culminated in a night in custody. Oh, wow. um, yeah, <laughs> not my, my finest moment, but also, I mean, one of the really cheesy, but like one of the worst moments of my life, but also one of the best moments because I was out of control. You know, I, I was an accident waiting to happen. And I, in some ways I got really lucky because the only person that got hurt was me, which is great. But also in custody, I had that time to think about, you know, how had this happened? How had I got here? And I had one of those epiphanies of, gosh, I'm the common denominator for all these events, all these things that have happened, the good stuff and the bad stuff. So therefore, if I've got myself here, I can get myself out of here. And I had that real moment of I am 100 percent responsible for my life. And it felt really powerful. So when I came out of custody, although I was looking at a very small prison sentence, which frightened the living wow. daylights out of me. You must have yeah. done something very serious. It was quite spectacular. It was quite <laughs> spectacular. I never want to do things by halves um but I sort of came out of there and vowed to sort my life out and that started with not drinking not taking drugs and that's what I did and I I had a lot to sort out there was a lot and it took years um but I was also really lucky I had some amazing people around me I just started doing my NLP practitioner I had an amazing trainer he totally got my number so it was like being in therapy whilst learning therapy. And that was really the start of my trajectory. And I, culmination of not drinking, not taking drugs, doing my NLP practitioner, really prioritizing myself. I felt like somebody had turned the lights on. It was like, wow. You know, it was like, it was, it was like night and day. The clarity was off the scale. 
life wasn't good. It was tough and it was tough for a long time because I'd left a trail of destruction behind me. So it took quite a while to sort that out. But I just kept going. I wasn't completely abstinent, but I was mostly alcohol free. I would have the occasional drink sort of in the middle. Um, but I haven't looked back. I've successfully changed my relationship with alcohol. And I've also, I was lucky enough to get a job in a secure unit, setting up a drug and alcohol treatment service. And then I sort of dipped around doing lots of different jobs in um, behavior change. So I've done pretty much every job there is to do in behavior change, sort of treatment services, mental health services, housing, as well as run three different treatment services until it didn't work for me. I had a great time. I loved it. Didn't work. Did loads of therapeutic and coaching qualifications as well. Was professionally coaching from like 2010. Um, so like 18 years personal experience and 18 years in behavior change and then about 14 years with the professional coaching therapeutic and then sort of set up on my own doing bits of coaching and it's evolved. Um, and now we've got the community interest company, which, you know, we run and it sort of does what it says on the tin, which is great. But also I do lots of other bits of coaching and consultancy as well, which I don't really talk about a lot, but. Yeah, it's me in a nutshell. I mean, that's that's absolutely fascinating. And I, I did actually see on your website, it looks like you've got an entire team of of uh, other yeah. coaches there as well. And they all specialize in different things. I even saw, like I think, yoga on there uh, as well yeah. as like with life coaching. And I'm sure I, I, I maybe I'm mistaken. I'm sure I saw something to do with like sex coaches as as well on there. Unless unless I literally just imagine that. But um, should but, be on there it's not yeah. but I'd love for it to be on there yeah but but I really I really like that you've got um uh your business is a very holistic approach to to kind of working on things um like even the sort of stuff that I've done with my clients like um, a lot of guys who come through into the dating industry uh I mean they there's usually like check boxes with the kind of problems that they've got that um, they aren't very sociable. Um, they obviously they haven't got a lot of confidence and they got high amount of anxiety. Um, they've probably developed some kind of bad uh, behavioral problems in a sense of just a lot of bad habits and things. So maybe they have resorted to drinking a lot. And so that's the only way that they feel that they can socialize with people. Or again, they can go on dates and they can, you know, bring out that that better version of themselves on there um and uh and i think even for me when i'm working with clients i always like the idea that you can't just be working on dating to build your confidence you have to have a much more uh holistic approach you have to work on all of the areas of your life so like your fitness your nutrition um even your fashion and how you groom yourselves as well um all of that can play a factor into just how you feel about yourself and even just the limiting beliefs that that you might have uh and one of which would be the reliance on having alcohol and that people feel like that they need it so uh i guess I, i'm kind of curious um because again you work with, with working with um with women what uh why why do most people tend to just rely on having alcohol and do you notice a difference really between like men and women when it comes to their reliance on it I don't I don't really notice a difference where we are now. I think historically there has been a difference. So historically, men have been, I would say, the target of advertising and marketing, you know, with lager in the 60s and barbecues and things like that, really pushing that. And I, you know, men working during the week, the Industrial Revolution, going to the pub at the weekend, all that type of stuff. And it wasn't really until the 80s, maybe even 90s, when we hit sort of the Ladek culture and, and alcohol industry really got that, hang on a minute, we've got this whole other <laughs> load of people that we can advertise to. And that's what they did. So I think we're in a situation now where men and women will have equal problems, you know, whereas historically it would have been mostly men. So I think when I started working in alcohol treatment services, it wasn't unusual for like the majority of the people that come through to be men. Mm. Whereas by the time we finished, that definitely shifted and we were getting more into the 60 percent men, 40 percent women for sure. Um, and I think we're pretty much on equal footing now. 
definitely with men and women. The problem we've got is it impacts on women more than men. Right. So men and women could drink the same amount of alcohol. I mean, obviously, I'm simplifying things and generalizing and genetics and lifestyle will play a factor as well. But generally, if a man was drinking, say, eight pints of lager daily over 20 years and a woman was drinking, you know, sort of two bottles of wine, you know, over the same amount of time, generally she is going to be feel the impact a lot more than the man. Mm. So in alcohol treatment services, we would see men come in between the ages of 40 and 50 with quite serious problems around alcohol and physical health problems. Whereas women, we could see that as young as early 20s and some women dying in their mid 20s as well. So women's bodies just aren't really geared up for the amount of alcohol. <laughs> and the problem we've got as well is alcohol is a legal drug. You know, yeah. it's crazy. Like, like my background, I'm a drug a drugs worker, essentially sort of my background and we say drugs and alcohol when actually we should just say drugs because alcohol is a drug so we separate it by saying drugs and alcohol in people's mind so the other problem we've got as well is alcohol is legal so then people make this assumption that it's an it's a legal drug so therefore it's okay and yeah. illegal drugs are bad when actually when it when we look at harm you know things like i'm going to get into a lot of trouble for this but <laughs> cannabis and magic mushrooms i love this it gets really contentious and i'm generalizing everybody before people start coming at me with stuff um cannabis and magic mushrooms are some of the most you know, the least harmful drugs, whereas alcohol is really up there in terms of the harm. Mm. But we've just got ourselves into a bit of a state with it. The It looks lovely. It's aggressively marketed to us. It's legal. It's socially acceptable. We have this massive culture around alcohol. Yeah. And then it's also highly addictive and hugely habit forming. You know, so we've got when people get into trouble with alcohol, they feel like there's something wrong with them and they feel like they're the only one when actually a lot of people get into trouble with alcohol and it's it's there's nothing wrong with you mostly yeah, you yeah, know it yeah. just is what it is it's a perfect storm we're living in a situation where a legal harmful highly addictive substance is aggressively marketed to you. you're a human being you love to seek out pleasure and alleviate pain therefore it is what it is dating is a classic example you could not have a problem with alcohol but there's no way you're going to do a date without alcohol. Mm. You know, that's not uncommon. It's not uncommon for me to work with people one-to-one, -one, for them to be alcohol-free, to feel the benefits, to feel amazing. And then they're like, oh, I want to date. And they're like, oh, my God, how am I going to do that without alcohol? Yeah. You know, and it's like, oh, no, because that's a really, like, heightened, anxious event, isn't it, the first date? Yeah, and... um yeah, it's it's certainly quite a difficult one for for a lot of guys. I know in in the years that I've worked in the dating industry, uh, I think one of the hardest things for guys to wrap their head around is if they don't have alcohol on a date, yeah. what 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 can they do? Um, yeah. If they're not able to at least hide behind putting some alcohol in their body, and then that gives them again that confidence to 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 flirt and charm their way into into whatever. Um, it, they I think a lot of them are just genuinely quite lost so I think if anything to begin with what what could be great is really just um why why should both men and women come off of having alcohol what would be the benefits of no longer putting that terrible substance into their bodies yeah and well that's the first thing is it's it's a poison you know and ingested in significant quantities it's it's poisonous so essentially there's lots of reasons why you should stop drinking and if anybody's interested in that read drink by professor david nutt you know one of the best things somebody can do for themselves is educate themselves with the facts there's a lot of misinformation out there that's the first place to start you know is there's a lot of harm that goes with alcohol short term and long term, but the benefits are just phenomenal. So even if somebody feels like they don't really have a problem with alcohol, you know, so somebody messaged me the other day and they're super healthy, super fit. They look amazing. And she was like, oh, I've been drinking two glasses of wine a night for ages, not really thinking it's a problem. And I just thought I'd be curious and stop. Um, and I did 30 days and I feel amazing. She, you know, she really noticed the difference. So things that we see are 
improvements in skin. I mean, I'm 55 and I'm blowing my own trumpet, but check that skin out, people. <laughs> so, like, if you if you're really like you're conscious of how you look, you know, alcohol will cause weight gain and puffiness and redness in the skin. You know, when you stop drinking, one of the things that we see is people notice a glow about you. Yeah. You know, so it's your skin, your eyes, your hair, your quality of sleep improves. You know, your brain function improves. You know, your mood improves. You know, it's the clarity of thought. You know your own mind. You know what you want. You know, you just feel so much better. You know, for People who love sports, like sports performance improves, you know, your work performance improves because because alcohol massively impacts on your brain function, you know, massively impacts on your brain function. You know, it's we're looking at things around early onset dementia and Alzheimer's and things like that. You're just, you're slowly killing yourself. So if you think like having as much alcohol free time as possible is like a superpower. And that's before we start talking about impact on erections. You know, when you get further down the line with dating, you know, if you have a bit of alcohol free time, that can really help with your erection as well. Your performance in the bedroom, you know, alcohol free sex is one of the best things ever because you're like totally present. You can feel everything. It feels good. You can take your time. You know, if you've had quite a bit to drink and that's your, you know, your basis for your sen- your sexual interactions, it can be a little bit of a blur and it can be a bit sloppy sometimes, which doesn't feel very nice either. Yeah. Well, I, it's, it's certainly an interesting one because uh, guys that I've known over the years when they've um, well, when they've, they've been drinking and then they've gone to sleep with someone, one of the things that they always complain about and ironically, they just don't, they're, they're kind of oblivious to the the answer as well, but they'll, they'll drink and then they'll sleep with someone or they'll uh, try and sleep with someone is really what I should say. And they, they just struggle. And then they wonder why they haven't been able to get an erection. And then afterwards, when I've spoken to them um, uh, or I've caught up with them and they've said, Oh, you know, I, I, I tried to sleep with her, but I, I just couldn't get hard. And, and I, I really struggle. And I don't know why. And then I say, well, what, what happened over the night? And then they'll say that they had like four or five glasses of something and yeah and and they've just clearly overdone it for whatever reason and yet people do seem to be somewhat oblivious to the fact that drinking way too much alcohol is going to is well for them they think it's not going to cause them any problems it's just gonna help make the situation for them even better do you find as well actually uh is it quite an easy thing for people to sort of slowly wean off of having alcohol or is it one that 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 people tend to struggle with? Because you certainly mentioned before how um, it is an addiction for people and because how society really encourages you to just constantly yeah. be drinking. Um, I yeah. think when people try to to sort of wean themselves off, they almost feel guilty uh, in in doing so. So I, I just sort of wonder like, what, uh, what what's your, been your experience with working with people when it's come to that, that sort of process of trying to wean them off of it? Yeah, I mean, it depends. I mean, the, the the key bit is, which will only apply to a small number of people, is if people have built up a physical addiction, which is one of the things that people don't realise with alcohol. You know, if you are drinking significant amounts daily, so for a man that would look something like, you know, 10 to 12 pints of lager, like around the 24 units, that doesn't mean that somebody is physically dependent, but I would want to assess if they are, because the problem we've got with alcohol is if you stop drinking and you have a physical dependency, then you can go into withdrawal, which is sweating, shaking, anxiety, paranoia, hallucinations, whole body shakes, potentially fits, and in very small cases can be fatal. And that's why alcohol practitioners get in a right state about it. And I get in a you know, one of my big things is training alcohol practitioners so they understand this because some people actually need to reduce. And sometimes even if you're not physically dependent, it's a lot kinder to reduce someone because of the anxiety around that. So the trouble with alcohol is people will say that they drink alcohol to help with their anxiety, but actually it's that short-term gain, long-term pain. So in the moment, Yes, because of the way it works with your brain chemistry, it may be improving your anxiety, but in the long term, it's making your anxiety worse. 
Yeah. Because you're, you're, so you're sort of, it's like compound interest. You're just making your anxiety worse. So sometimes we reduce people because it's a lot easier for them to do that around their anxiety. Um, but if they can, some people just want to stop, just stop and like have a little bit of alcohol free time. It's so varied. I, I mean, it's, there are so many different types of drinking patterns out there and everybody's so different and their lifestyle about what they want and where they're at and what's going on. I find that with support, and I would say this, that 99% of the time with support, people can massively reduce their drinking or be alcohol free. Um, And interestingly, I find men get it a lot quicker than women. Really? Why why is that? um, I was going to say it's really awful now, but (laughs) I find that, and and I'm generalising, obviously, men... They get it really quickly. There's something more simpler about their thought processes when it comes to alcohol. So once you sort of give men the facts and the benefits and how that's going to improve. Now, sports usually, sports and work usually play quite a big part in this around motivators and also dating with the erections, absolutely, performance right. in the bedroom. So if somebody's quite sporty or they start doing sport and they have a bit of alcohol-free time and they're quite competitive, they massively notice the difference really quickly and it's just a no-brainer. And they're on it because they're just like, oh, my God, that's massively improved my sports performance or I'm doing really well at work or actually sex is off the scale. You know, I can get an erection whenever I want. And it's just like they've got it. You know, within the first couple of weeks, they've got it and they're off. Yeah, I'm not yeah. saying they don't have hurdles. They do. Obviously, like you say, the anxiety and the dating, that can be a really big thing for quite a lot of men and requires quite specialist intervention. Um, but in terms of the alcohol, men tend to get it quite quickly. The only bit where I see men struggle is if they don't have that support to talk about how they're feeling. Mm -hmm. So that's where they get into paying a professional. Um, If they don't have that in their friendship group. But then also it can be, you know, where they have a culture of they go to the pub with their mates and that's ingrained in their sort of lifestyle and they struggle to go to the pub or maybe there isn't you know an alcohol free option on draft you know so then because they want to fit in so alcohol free lagers is literally one of the best things that's ever happened for men I can say because they can go to the pub and have a drink and they can feel normal unless somebody knows so that can be quite a big stumbling block but Alcohol free is becoming more and more popular or drinking less or just taking that option. So what I've noticed, particularly in my male friendship group, because it's catching. So pretty much nearly all my friends are alcohol free now. Um, It's taken 18 years. But all it takes is for one man to be like, no, 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 I need to take a bit of time off alcohol. You know, I've got liver problems. I've got stomach problems. It's messing with my relationship or whatever, whatever reason. And then... The other men get curious. And if that man is of a certain confidence to say they're happy to talk about it and they're happy to support other men, then it's catching. But if you don't have that and you're the first one, that can be quite difficult in your friendship group. Yeah, it's very much a culture thing with guys. And there is yeah. most certainly an element of peer pressure as well, where, yeah, if you're going into, into a bar or, or a pub or wherever with someone, uh, even I think I've definitely experienced it as well, where because if, if I'm filming with people and I don't really want to get drunk because I've got all my equipment and I, you know, I don't want to accidentally put it down and forget about it. Um, even with that clarity to people to say that I've got a very justifiable reason why I do not want to get drunk. Um, even then I'll be out with sort of peers or even other dating coaches or whoever and they'll be they'll you know they'll make like all the jokes and stuff like oh no you got to do it you know and sometimes I'll cave and then sometimes I won't I'll be like no I'm I'll, I've got to be quite stern here and say no I I really do not want to to lose my stuff but I can yeah. definitely sort of like resonate them with guys who they they might feel especially if they aren't get confident or maybe they're like the least confident of their their peers that the yeah. only way that they can fit in is by literally trying to be as equal as they possibly can um, yeah. with the the people that they're surrounding with themselves with. 
which isn't yeah. a shame, but also at the same time, maybe they're also just spending time around people who maybe aren't the best influence on them if they're their friends that should be instead sort of being very welcoming and saying, look, absolutely no problem. If you don't want to drink, don't worry. Um, and I actually wasn't aware that there were alcohol-free lagers. Um, I knew there there are obviously the the cocktails because of course you go you go anywhere, any kind of bar, restaurant, even, and you can get the uh, the mocktails of sorts. Um, but I wasn't aware that there were even sort of like alcohol-free lagers of stuff. So I mean, that's that's quite fascinating uh, as well. But but really, really good that at least there is more of um, a selection uh, of different drinks for. Um, for people so if they don't want to have alcohol then they don't have to necessarily have it i actually i rem remembered the other thing uh, that i wanted to uh bring up especially with the um the erectile dysfunction um issue as well uh that it, what's something else that's interesting is that there is it definitely seems to be a stigma of when um i don't know if stigma is probably the right word but when people tend to get really drunk and then they sleep with someone they always feel really guilty about it afterwards. And it's funny how even, even though people are aware of that bad behavior of getting drunk to get to that point so you can sleep with someone, that every single time they'll walk away with like the, the biggest regret on them. And, and I've known this definitely for I think both men and women that they both kind of both say, like, oh, I got too drunk. I shouldn't have done that and, and all this. So it, it's just, I think, another example of really why people should probably come off of the alcohol, if not for removing just the issue of um, uh, sort of sexual problems. Uh, in fact, are there are there any sexual problems for, for women? I mean, we meant, you mentioned with, with men, but is there also ones for women as well when it comes to, to that, that kind of moment? I don't know. I mean, there's the fertility thing. I mean, that's not necessarily a sexual problem. I think the biggest thing is when you're under the influence, you're disinhibited, you are more relaxed, depending on how much you drink, you will make decisions that you wouldn't normally make. You're not thinking clearly, you're not present. And I think it's really classic that a lot of people will do things that probably they wouldn't do if they weren't drinking. What's really interesting when you talk to people about alcohol-free dating, because it's something that comes up quite a lot in my world, maybe further down the line, but is that how much slower it is, which I personally love. You know, I've done a lot of alcohol-free dating. I was single for about 10 years. I didn't date the whole 10 years, but I did dip my toe in the water quite a bit and do sort of real conscious periods of dating. Um and for me, it's just lovely how slow it is. I know people find that excruciating because if you're used to drinking and dating, it's not unusual for people to go out on a date, to drink too much, and then to actually have sex on that first night. And it's like, you're... Why would you do that? Get intimate, intimate with somebody that you don't necessarily know. I mean, I'm not that's it's a whole other conversation about if you want to have sex have sex you know there's nothing wrong with that i'm not it's being a prude. very yeah it's a very each to their own kind of experience because yeah. i i've i've yeah. had plenty of guys who've come through um in the dating industry and some you know they much prefer to wait until like the third or fourth date for something mischievous to happen uh others they want it on the first date and then you've got people who yeah. will say that well they want to get to know someone first and then others say well we want to yeah. know what our sexual compatibility is first so then we can kind of take it from there so yeah it very it very is much uh an, an each to their own um kind of situation yeah. so i can get that yeah but if you're alcohol what's really interesting about the alcohol free and this is something i talk about a lot and it's something that i did that worked really well for me was that first date if you don't know someone which quite often i didn't when i was dating and most people you know most of the women that i work with don't you know they've it's dating apps or blind dates or someone set them up or they've just met someone but didn't really you know interact with them hmm. is that first date is a meet and greet you know it's a coffee date you don't know this person 
just go and meet them during the day at breakfast, have a chat with them. Do you like them? Do you want to see them again? You know, it really is that simple. You're just having a conversation. And the last thing you want to do is add a drug into the mix that's going to impact on how you think and feel. And then, like you say, because if you drink, you're going to relax, which is great. But if you are somebody that drinks more than you would like to in those situations because you're nervous and you don't know what to do with yourself then it can run away with you and it's a bit of a double whammy because it's you did something that maybe you wouldn't have done if you didn't drink as much but it's also how alcohol impacts on the brain so it's going to make you think like that anyway you know all those thoughts and feelings those negative thoughts and feelings the anxiety that's part of the alcohol withdrawal so it's going to do that to you. It's the double whammy. It's the same way as if somebody said to me, oh, I smoked cannabis and then I felt paranoid. Well, of course you did because that's <laughs> the cannabis. Yeah. But people, they, they think, oh, yeah, like that if you say that. But if you say it with alcohol, they don't realise that that's how alcohol works on your brain. You could go out on a date, drink too much, not have sex, have a wonderful time, but you might still probably feel quite shit about it because of how alcohol works on the brain. Yes. Yeah. So the two questions. So the first one was, um, I think something that is quite interesting for guys that I have noticed why they do tend to rely on alcohol is because the actual length of the day tends to be yes. longer than what it yes. needs to be. So yes. it, it gets to, so I think they, even if they start off trying to be well behaved and, and not have alcohol, I think they start getting to a point where because the date has gone on maybe to a certain point where, um, yeah things maybe sizzle down or, or the energy kind of dies down and things. And they think oh, I need to, you know, the only way I'm going to build attraction with her is if I can keep that energy there and we can have that flirty banter. And I think that's probably like the steering of the direction in where the alcohol tends to play a part. Like I've known guys to go on length of dates that seem to be like three, four hours. And, and in a way, I mean, that's a crazy amount of time with someone that yeah. yes, you've just met and it puts way too much pressure on the situation. Yeah. Of, like right we have to like tick all the boxes on absolutely everything we've got to almost decide um uh in these few hours like are we a perfect match for something you know amazing to happen and i do think that's probably where a lot of the anxiety comes into play and i, I will actually ask you for uh for date ideas that are um non-alcohol yeah. uh free but uh, the other thing I was going to ask, which there you go, I'm so glad my memory is coming back to me now. Um, but the other thing, though, because you mentioned um, that you'd, you'd kind of been single for 10 years. So I'm curious when you when you were uh, having your dating life, was that through dating apps or or was that uh, meeting people uh, in real life through like a, events or what what was what was the story there with with meeting people? I was a bit of a mix. It was. So I didn't, like I said, I didn't date all the time. Sometimes I would think, okay, I need to get out there, you know, been single for ages, need to test the water, practice, you know, figure out what you're looking for. You know, you've got to be in it, haven't you, to figure it out. You can't figure it out by not being in it. Um, so, yeah, I did do some dating apps. I also told friends what I was looking for. So friends would fix me up with people if they thought they were suitable. So sort of blind that, dates. That, that's good friends of yours to to do something like that. So I, I'm a great believer in using your network, definitely, because mm. you just never know. Um, and through work or, and I did a lot of partner dancing, which I highly recommend. And I know it would be excruciating for a lot of men, but like the alcohol-free date, once you've been once, you'll be fine. And you'll realize that, that you're- Is that things like salsa and bachata? And yes. Things? Okay. Yeah. yeah. So I did, I started off with Modern Jive and I, then I did all of them. Oh, pretty very much old school. All of them. Yeah. yeah. And, <laughs> and what's, wonderful about that it's I think I was six months alcohol free when I first went a friend took me and it was this massive room full of people all ages all backgrounds terrible music no one can dance so it really doesn't matter and also the pressure is off around talking you're still connecting with people 
you know, you're, you're dancing with them, you're having fun. And the way the class is set up is it's set up to break the ice, mm. you know. So if you come in at the beginning and you do the class, you've probably met everybody in the room by the time you finish and then you can have a little practice. You know, anybody can ask anybody to dance, but you're still touching people and connecting with them and interacting with them. And you don't have to talk and it's three minutes, you know. So it's like in terms of like hanging out, with someone you you know different people with humans and learning how to connect if you, if you really want to have a couple of drinks go and have a couple of drinks you know it's not the end of the world you probably wouldn't get drunk in that environment because it mm. just isn't the environment where people are drinking a lot so it's quite an easy thing to do so i did a lot of that and met people through that as well what were, what were people's uh, or what were the guys reactions when you would say to them that, oh, I, I don't drink alcohol? Because I assume you've probably had guys come forward again through whether it be in person or even through dating apps. Probably more be more interesting to hear your your thoughts with the dating app side of things where you haven't where there's, I think, more of a blind date kind of element to it. Um, yeah. But what has been your reactions to people when they've then said, like oh, I'd love to take you out on a date? or let's go on a drink or let's go for drinks sometime. And then there has been the bombshell moment of you saying, um, oh, I, I don't have any alcohol. Um, what, what's usually been the reactions? It's really interesting you say that, actually. So through dating apps, I probably didn't say that unless I was asked. I probably didn't volunteer it. Yeah. And in fact, I think there was what the last app I did, you actually could put that in your profile. It was set up for that. I can't remember which one it was um it might be hinge but, actually because so because uh, oh, in fact no i would have thought probably all of them because um uh it's one of those preferences that you are bound to get people who would much prefer not to have alcohol or people where they can gauge yeah. are you just a very sociable person or are you very much addicted to having alcohol although i think that's yeah. a funny option to have on a, a dating app yeah per se to say that i i drink all the time yeah it's a bit so God, it was quite a long time ago now. <laughs> so mostly, if I was talking to people on a dating app, I mean, I'm really assertive for starters. So I don't really have a problem interacting with people or meeting people for the first time. And for me, on the dating apps, it was very much about quick conversation and then meet for coffee. Because you can't tell unless you meet somebody in person. You, I was never somebody that wanted, you know, if men wanted to just talk endlessly with me, I'd be like, no, yes. <laughs> this is not what I'm, I, either you want to meet me for coffee or you don't, you know. So I would always start with let's meet for coffee. Because for me, like you said, the length of time, the first date for me is very much the meet and greet. So I always found that if I said meet for coffee, like during the day, it set up the president that it was an hour, maybe mm. max, you know, you're just having a coffee. Um, and actually, I found that that was more than enough time for me, you know, to just get to know. A lot of the men found that really difficult because I would meet them and, and literally when the hour was up i'd be like okay it was lovely to meet you thank you very much bye yeah. <laughs> and they'd be like who is this person <laughs> like, yeah. sometimes it would come up in conversation there were quite a few men that if i met them out and about it was always the oh should we go for a drink it's really interesting it's like it's that acceptable how you ask somebody for a date yeah, it's you know it's, it's, that there's fallback not... option it is that fallback yes. option that's all people yeah yeah going towards yeah yeah and so there was quite a lot, and I wouldn't say anything because I, what I was fully aware of throughout my dating experience was the majority of the men were incredibly nervous and very anxious for whatever reason. So I just wanted to make things easy for them because I could see that it was excruciating for them, like absolutely excruciating. Um, so if somebody said, do you want to meet for a drink? I would be like, yeah course and I wouldn't say anything because it just isn't an issue for me you know mm. I can sit in a bar it doesn't bother me for a lot of people it is an issue and they might need to say actually can we meet for coffee or go for breakfast or go for a walk but I would meet them you know in the bar um and they would say oh what can I get you for drink and then that would be the first time it would come up usually I'd be like oh can I have a lime and soda and they'd be like oh don't you want a drink and I'd be like no I'm fine with a lime and soda thank you and sometimes I'd say I'm driving, 
you know, sometimes I'd just be like, I don't want to get into it. So I would just sidestep it like, oh, I've got something to do tomorrow or whatever. And people, some people would leave it at that. And some people would be like, oh, did you used to have a problem with alcohol? And that's not a conversation I want to have on a first date. No, that, that's, yeah, that's quite a forward, uh, I don't know if like forward and direct would be the right word for it. But I mean, that's, that's quite a personal question yeah. to, to ask someone, you know, on a very extreme yeah. scale. Yeah. So I I was, and I suppose because of my work and my training and I'm very good at managing the conversation, which is a little bit naughty in a way, because it's like, I'm on a date, you know, I'm just going to see, do I like you? Do I want to meet you again? That's what I'm doing. You know, mm. that's what I'm there for. So m- some of the time I'd be spending my time putting them at ease because they were so nervous and then if people were wanting to dig a bit more into my past I would just be very carefully like sidestepping that because there's yeah. there was very few people I was willing to like oh yeah I was arrested and <laughs> yeah I was gonna say yeah you don't want to be mentioning literally on the first date that yeah just so you know I went to oh. jail <laughs> or I nearly yeah. went, nearly got put away for a period of time yeah uh, yeah but yeah so um it's really yeah it was really interesting when I did meet my current boyfriends, um, so I used a matchmaking service, which okay. worked really well for me, worked really well. And she chose three men for me to look at. And I was like, yeah, great. I'll go out on dates with all of them. Back to my, I never know until I meet someone. Mm. She was quite prescriptive and said, no, I want you to meet this one. <laughs> I was like, all right, then oh. <laughs> you're in charge. <laughs> But he, we spoke on the phone, which was really unusual for me because I don't really like doing that. And then we agreed to meet for a walk. Um, and I don't think we'd even discussed it then. And we met for a walk in an afternoon and he was incredibly nervous, like incredibly nervous. And we just went on a walk and we had a chat. And I was like, that was really nice. I could definitely meet you again. You know, I didn't want to stick pins in my eyes. So it was like, yeah, I'll meet you again. Mm. So we just went for walks because, you know, that was, I wasn't offering anything else and he was quite nervous and that worked really well for him. By the time we did sit down and eat something together, he did have a drink. So we were quite sort of five or six dates in before that even came up. It was like, oh, do you want to drink? No, thanks. I don't drink. But at that point, I... I felt comfortable enough to say to him, you know, to give him a snippet of my story. Yeah. It was really interesting. He never overdrank with me, even though it turned out that he was drinking quite a lot of the time. Mm. He would have one or two because of his nerves. It was never an issue that I didn't drink. He was inspired by it. He loved it. Um, and then as time went on, he experimented with alcohol-free lagers. I never said anything. He's very sporty. And he was training for an Ironman. And he just was curious about, well, if I'm alcohol-free while I'm training, see how this improves my performance. His performance was off the scale. And that was it. He's never looked back. And he's been alcohol-free for a good few years now. Yeah, and, and even on top of that, I mean, that's there's something actually really beautiful about with that that situation that he did that on his own and he did that for yes. you without you even sort of like suggesting to him or giving him the hint of like, yeah. oh, I want you to be alcohol free. He he decided on that. So, I mean, that that really shows just the level of commitment and care that he has for you to be willing to actually let go of alcohol. And try life without it and to do the Ironman as well I mean that's that's not an easy feat Uh, I know there's different sorts of um uh trainings over the years that or over the year that you can do from like obstacle courses to that uh I can't think what the mud challenge is there's one where you're like like oh yeah I know the one yeah might be the might be the Spartan something I'll I'll have to I'll have to have a look but but that that I think is a really really nice story and something really then that that a good takeaway from that is that guys can at least try to, you know, go on dates that, that don't necessarily need alcohol or maybe just limit the amount of alcohol that they're doing. They don't need to have as many as they are having. And actually what I'm curious about is um, uh, with even other dates that you went on uh, or first dates, I should say, 
Um, if there were, if your date uh, was drinking and and you didn't, did that change the dynamic at all? Did they, did it make them feel weird, or did they feel weird because they were drinking and that you weren't? Um, what what was the kind of dynamic that played out uh, in those moments? I suppose I was very aware that a lot of the men I was meeting on first dates were uncomfortable and they were uncomfortable because of the date and then me not drinking if we were in that environment probably didn't help at all Mm. so I would overcompensate for that um probably why I never went out on second dates with any of them because I would literally coach them through that hour to make sure they got through it and they had a good experience and they didn't come away from that giving themselves really hard time because that's the last thing they needed to do um so yeah it was I was just acutely aware of how it was for them um and yeah that's why it didn't really and none of them really worked for me but when I suppose the difference when I met Chris was we went out for walks And he was very nervous and it just, it was really, really slow. I suppose there was something there each time that we we had some sort of shared history, some shared, you know, there was enough common ground for us to keep meeting. But it wasn't really until like the fifth date or so where I was like, actually, I really like this guy. You know, I'm willing to open up a little bit more. So we probably did we probably dated like once every two weeks so it was incredibly slow which I loved and he was okay with because it gives you plenty of time to be like get to know them to text to talk on the phone without it being too much you know and do I want to invest in this person for sure interesting so I think if anything leading on to the the big question is date ideas so yes uh again i absolutely love the idea of being able to get guys to go on dates where they don't need to have alcohol and i think even then one of the biggest complaints that guys have is just the amount of money that they spend on dates for having alcohol and then they just regret it afterwards so i like the idea of them going on dates that then they aren't worried about having alcohol which then should hopefully remove the uh the the complaining of them saying oh i spent too much money and and nothing happened or or it didn't work out we're not seeing each other again and so on and then they just have way too many first dates and then again the cycle continues complaining about money and so on um but what uh date ideas would you recommend to guys um when it comes to having alcohol free dates Well, I think that a key thing that you said earlier was about time, isn't it? And it's that first date is the meet and greet and how you set that up. So it, it, unless you really want to spend a long time with someone that you don't have to. So it's thinking about the time of day is part of it as well, not just the activity. So the coffee in the morning or breakfast, even, you know, or afternoon coffee. So time of the day is quite important, particularly say if you're at work and you do a lunchtime, you know, so you have that excuse to get away as well. So I think shortening the time is really key on a first day. But I think activities can be good too. Because I know eating can be really difficult sometimes. Like some women don't want to eat on a first day. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a messy eater myself. So the, you know, it's a very intimate thing for someone to watch me eat food. Um, especially as I don't like sharing. (laughs) No, no, it's funny. I think my boyfriend did me spaghetti on like our fifth date. And I was like, what are you doing, man? (laughs) (laughs) Spaghetti. You didn't think that through at all. This is going to be horrible. (laughs) Um, I think walking is great. You know, any activity, like going for a walk is brilliant. You know, there's a reason why therapeutically we do walk and talk with certain people, you know, with challenging behaviour and stuff like that, because it's a great way of getting people talking. So walking is brilliant. Any activity is great, like bowling. It doesn't matter if you can do it, you know, like really simple stuff. Um, I mean, paddle boarding or body boarding is probably a bit, a lot of people wouldn't like that. I would love it. You know, if somebody said, let's go paddle boarding, I'd be like, yes, 
and there. So you have, sometimes you have to check that out. You know, going for a swim, going to a, an evening's dance class, you know, stuff like that. So anything where you're doing stuff, where it forces you to do things and have fun and the focus isn't on, because the big thing around, forget about dating, just being alcohol free and socializing, is that you sit, you go somewhere and you sit and there's no alcohol, you're not doing anything. And it's just like the intensity of, oh my God, I've got to talk to this person and listen. <laughs> Mm. it's just a bit much really so as if you can play games or dance or bowl or you know cook together go to a cooking class you know something like that I mean spa's great a bit further along the line but think about the time of day think about the amount of time that you want to spend you know how you set that up but yeah activities are a win I know my boyfriend and I we play card we played a lot of cards in our first six months because I wasn't drinking. So it's like, let's do something. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. I, I, th I think that's a, a great idea. I, I like the idea of um, outdoor dates, especially now that the weather is also getting uh, a lot better. Um, especially in London, there's so many different parks. Uh, there's yeah. a ridiculous amount of coffee shops to be able to go and pick up a coffee yeah. and then go for a walk anywhere, especially places that have, uh views and landmarks and so on yeah. so i, I kind of like the idea of that and even then bringing back the idea of just limiting the time of how long yeah. that initial date is for uh yeah i think the hour hour and a half is um is a sweet spot um and i've even suggested to guys like try and just limit that first date to an hour hour and a half because yeah i think it also gives off a bit of a negative impression to women if you're kind of the guy who's got way too much free time. Um, it, it sounds silly, but when you've got men who just, they don't seem to have some like social life, they're not being proactive, doing things. And if they're going to an arrange, if they're going to arrange a date with someone um, and rather than just maybe picking one or two days, they say, oh, I'm pretty much free every single night this week from like this time. You know, there's nothing very attractive to it. And it sounds too... Like, like you're not really in that much demand that like you've just got way too much free time and no one's really sort of bothering with you. Um, so I, yes. I do like the idea of even, even if they do have a lot of free time, I still think it's important just to limit and cap that time that you do spend on dates. So yeah. you can have that opportunity to take the pressure off and be like, you know what, we'll get to know each other. And if we like each other we've got a great reason at the end of this first date to arrange that second date and yeah. whether it be then i suppose alcohol free or not at least then people can be very sensible with the amount of alcohol they have knowing that there's kind of less pressure on that if you're seeing someone a second time round or maybe if it's even a third time maybe you've been kind of well behaved on the second date as well and you've done an activity like bowling or something then at least when it comes to that point that if if people can't escape having alcohol, at least they can just try and be more behaved with it. And hopefully um, they can kind of come to the realization that they don't need to be reliant on it, especially if there are a lot of negative um, uh, outcomes from it as well. Because I know a lot of guys do complain about with the sexual performance and that's the last thing they want to have happen especially if they're with someone that they really like and that they are attracted to. And then suddenly they have to try and explain themselves or they create this perpetuating cycle of getting stressed out about not getting an erection. Yeah. And then they, they, they don't get the erection because they're stressed out and, and it just kind yeah. of goes around in circles. And then the alcohol just feeds into that, that negativity um, even more so. Uh, and I yeah. think just jumping back uh, before we definitely I've, I've only got like two more things to ask you afterwards and then we'll we'll wrap it. Um, but even just going back, talking about the uh, the the placebo um, issue just before we, we had yes. to start. Um, so many years ago, I was actually uh, part of a placebo experiment with, uh, with for Darren Brown. So it was an episode that aired on TV and we were all given a pill that we, we were told would cure our fears and phobias. And I think for me, one of the just the fascinating things was that, you know, we were just given a pill that had nothing more than like sugar in or icing from a cake. 
And yet the experiences that we all had from it, you know, my, myself and the group of people that I was with in the episode, you know, it was just phenomenal. The, the realization was just everything that happened was because of our own mindset that everything yes. was just a shift. Um, and I think the the relevance there and why I bring it up is just fascinating that if people are moving from alcohol to alcohol free, that I do wonder if there's also some level of a placebo that takes place there, that even though there's not a single drop of alcohol in their drink, that maybe they still feel those same kind of symptoms of being drunk because of maybe the familiarity of the flavors in the drink um or how much maybe they they have of it as well um so yeah. i want just wondered really if there were, uh did you kind of like see any of that play out when people uh when you were working with people when they were going from alcohol to no alcohol absolutely and this is one of the brilliant things about alcohol free drinks it doesn't work for everyone but if you understand how the mind works you can use it for sure because we live in the feeling of our thinking you know if you think you can you can if you think you can't you can't you know it's it's all up here as you know with the work that you do and, and the way that you teach people absolutely and you can use it in the same way so you know it's something that not it didn't happen initially and it took me quite a lot. It took me a really long time to figure out how to socialize without drugs and alcohol. But once I realized I was being odd and I needed to sort it out <laughs> for everybody else. Um, something that's really interesting is that it's the environment, it's the people, it's the time of day. You're anchoring, aren't you? you you're, it's a habit. So it's like that association. So whether you have an alcohol free drink or not, you know, I can go to a bar and have a lime and soda. But if I'm hanging out with certain people in a certain environment, there's certain music playing, then I can feel loose and I can like get into the groove quite quickly and, you know, access those familiar feelings because that's how powerful humans are. Once we understand that, we can use that. You know, I used to teach teenagers about drugs and alcohol and we talk about each drug in great detail about how they worked and how they impacted and how they felt and some of the kids would be like oh my god miss i need you feel like i've taken speed like oh my god <laughs> did you do that I'm like, that's how powerful your brain is it used to be yeah. amazing teaching kids that because they'd like they totally get it it's like as imagine like you don't need a drug you can access that feeling without the drug just by your thinking and feeling they'd be like oh my god you know like these teenagers in the room it'd be phenomenal so whether you access it or not you can learn how to access it one of the things that um my boyfriend talks about he loves alcohol free lager is he definitely gets that first drink hit off yeah. the alcohol free lager he loves it and actually it's interesting because Professor David Nutt, who is the Don, I highly recommend everybody check him out. He has created a drink called Censure, which has actually got certain types of herbs in it that create, you know, that feeling of relaxation. So I bought some of it. Now, he loves it. it he feels relaxed and he really enjoys that drink. He loves alcohol-free lager and he gets that hit as well. I don't like the Censure and how it makes me feel because I could, it feels different. And I'm like, oh, I didn't like that. I like how I feel being this way. So it's a very individual thing. And alcohol-free drinks weren't a thing when I started out, hence why I keep talking about lime and soda, because that's just like as all there was available. So a lot of people are quite hesitant about alcohol-free drinks. They're like, oh, is that a good thing to do or a bad thing to do? And it's like, it's a good thing. It's got no alcohol in it. If it works for you, use it. If you get a placebo, that is a good thing. Use it. Please don't worry about it. Yeah. And even with the low alcohols, the low art lagers, bloody brilliant. You know, 1%, 2% crack on. Yeah, because you're massively reducing your harm. And that is a good thing. Well, I love it. That, that sounds great. And like I say, I had no idea that there was alcohol-free lagers. So uh, I might have to even just try that just to see if yeah. uh what what it tastes like first of all and then actually see do i get that also first hit yeah uh, of the placebo with it that would be absolutely fascinating well just before we do uh wrap up something that um uh, i i love to be able to ask people is um besides the coaching that you do 
Um, are there any other recommendations of like other coaches or people that you know that really do complement the kind of work that you offer to people? That's a great question. And it, I, it's going to sound awful the way that I'm going to answer this. So in my space, I know a lot of coaches in my space. So the coaches on my website are coaches that are supported by me and I recommend them. So something that you'll know is coaching is like the Wild West. Mm. Just because people are qualified, just because people are registered, yeah. it doesn't, doesn't mean, mean they're, great they're great coaches. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, um, just because if people aren't, doesn't mean they're not great either. Mm. Just because somebody charges 10,000 doesn't mean they're great. Just because somebody charges 50 quid, it doesn't mean they're shit. You know, unfortunately... Yeah it's really difficult out there knowing, you know, who to trust and who to work with. So in my space, I've got a pretty good grip on what's going on. And so I know outside of that, they actually find it really difficult. So relationship coaching, I'd love to have somebody to refer to. I tend to refer people to relate, which is a bit hit and miss. Mm. Um, nutritionists, I have people that I can refer to, which is great. Um, any any names that, you want to shout out? Um, Nia Davis is wonderful. Gwen Warren is wonderful. Um, I'm trying to think now. Gosh, I'm sure there is another nutritionist that we work with. We've got a few that are absolutely brilliant, but they're the two that come to mind. I mean, Claire Flaxon is a mindset coach and she is phenomenal. She knows her stuff. She's incredibly ethical. Um, yeah, and now I've met you. I can refer somebody for dating because that's the other thing that comes up. Do you work with women as well? I do not. I've not so much. I mean, most of my audience is is men, or, or clientele tends yeah. to be men, um, yeah. because of working uh, uh, definitely in the dating industry. You find I think more men come through. Uh, I know Haley Quinn tends to have a lot of uh, women. I think she's probably the one person that I know who has mostly women come through for uh, for clients. Yeah. Um, but a lot of what I do is about really just trying to encourage people to move off of dating apps and do like more in-person stuff. Yes. Um, so I will, so I, I'm a big believer in exposure therapy and desensitization therapy. So I will basically take uh, men out and say mostly men, uh, take them out on the streets of London and I will get them to basically go and talk to strangers in a very uh, honest and authentic kind of way and, and just Love be respectful it. about it. Um, and it's amazing just the amount of people who've got dates and had relationships and stuff. I've known people who've got yeah. married and they've had kids because of they've met their ideal partner simply from walking down Oxford Street and uh, and striking a conversation. So, you know, it's amazing what you can kind of materialize if people put the effort in and desensitize themselves from that fear of just going over to someone that they like and just saying, hey, look, I thought you would look quite cute. And I wanted to say hello. I love, I love it. I love it. I need. I, well, I've got to do an interview with you, Daniel, because we need to talk about dating. Because, like, yeah, that's amazing for my audience. That's great. Yeah. yeah no, for sure. Um, I love that. Yeah. So essentially, the the people that I've got on my website are people that are vetted by me. So I would vouch for them. Um. And yeah, Nia Davis isn't on there, but she's great. And Claire Flaxon isn't on there, but she's amazing. Now I know you, which is fab. Um, but yeah, I tend to live in my own little world. Very rarely step out of it. So it's very nice to step out into the dating world. Thank you. <laughs> but I think that's also great that you've actually got a team, really, of people that you trust. Yeah. And if they all kind of integrate with each other and help each other, then, I mean, that's yeah. that's perfect as well. Because what I'll do is I'd love to be able to tag basically your, your team, let them get promoted as well. I think, I, again, yeah. I, I like the holistic approach to stuff. And if people are going to work on one area of their life, why not consider all of the other areas that they need to? So everything's kind yeah. of brought up at the, the same level rather than something being left behind. Um, yeah. But we are, I know we've got about a minute left. So uh, just to wrap up, um, I'd love for you to kind of let people know um, how they can reach you, how they can find you. Um, and then I will, uh, I will let you go back to your boyfriend and, and the dog and, and your son and stuff. Um, and then we'll, We'll have a, a good day. Um, yeah, so uh, you can contact me through my website, Women Who Don't Drink, but my email is stephaniechivers at hotmail.co.uk. 
Um, you can contact me on any of the social media sites. If you want to work with a man, I am actually in the process of training up some men. So hopefully soon I will have some men that I can refer to as well in terms of reducing your drinking. But literally the best thing you can do is educate yourself. So go get drink by Professor David Nutt and start there. Um, but yeah, and work on your dating because love is everything. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, honestly, Stephanie, thank you so much for your time. I will let you go. Um, but thank you very much uh, again for all of the advice and stuff that you've given to guys. And I know it would make a, a, a huge difference to, to everyone as well. Brilliant. Thank you very much for having me.